Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with crispy cider batter chicken fingers. That's right, believe it or not, the best beer batter is not made with beer. It is actually done with sparkling apple cider, which produces a light, beautifully crispy, and very flavorful coating. Not to mention it's extremely easy and only requires two ingredients. In fact, the only downside is that I'd rather drink leftover beer than leftover cider. But other than that, this really is an incredible technique. And to get started, the first thing we'll do is slice up our chicken breasts, which I like to do first by flipping them over so we can find that natural crease where the tenderloin was removed. And we'll make our first cut right there, at which point I like to turn the breast and then cut from the thinner end to the thicker end at a little bit of an angle, attempting to get pieces of chicken roughly the size of a finger. And yes, using my cutting method, you will get different lengths, but when frying chicken fingers, it's not about the length, it's all about the girth. Okay, we need these pieces to have a very similar thickness so that they all finish cooking at the same time. And that's it, once our chicken's been fingered, we will transfer that into a mixing bowl and season it up with some kosher salt, some freshly ground black pepper, and some cayenne. At which point we'll mix this all together until it's evenly coated. And of course, if you want to use some more exotic herbs and spices for this stage, go ahead. I mean, you are after all the Roger Daltrey of how to season your poultry. And this is where you can show us, culinarily speaking, who are you? Who, 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 who? So please feel free to customize this as you see fit. And then once we have that flavored, we'll go ahead and sprinkle over a few tablespoons of flour and we'll give the bowl the old shake a up which will partially coat our chicken strips with the flour but we will need to go in with our hands or tongs to finish the job. And we do wanna make sure every bit of that surface area is coated with flour. And then once that's set, I like to transfer these onto a rack so that the surface can dry out a little bit. Although just transferring those onto a plate will also work. And yes, many people will add the salt and seasonings to the flour, but using that method, I'm never quite sure how much of that seasoning is getting to the chicken. So I much, much prefer to salt and season the chicken first. I just think it works out much better. And then what we'll do is transfer our flour chicken into the fridge for at least 10 minutes to give it time to adhere properly, but also so our chicken stays cold while we make our batter, which is gonna begin with a cup of self-rising flour. And as I dump this into the bowl, please note the giant cloud of dust that appears. Okay, in addition to already having the baking powder and salt milled into the flour, this stuff tends to be ground a lot finer than regular all-purpose flour, which seems to work out very nicely for batters like this. So yes, while you can just add baking powder and salt to regular flour to make this, I do recommend the self-rising flour if you can find it, which you can. And then to this, we will add our only other ingredient, and that would be some sparkling apple cider. And in the spirit of full disclosure, I'm using a hard cider, which I prefer for batters and drinking, but a non-alcoholic cider will also work. And for a cup of flour, I'm gonna whisk in about a cup and a quarter of cider. Okay, I usually start with about a cup, and then I'll check it. And if it seems a little bit thick, I'll add another splash. And basically what we're trying to end up with here is something that's like a very thin pancake batter, right? Something closer to, but not quite as thin as a crepe batter. And as you may know, the thinner your batter, the thinner and crispier your coating's gonna be. But we don't want it too thin. And it definitely needs to be thick enough to coat the back of a spoon. And then what we'll do once we have that mixed up is transfer it into the fridge so it can sit for at least five to 10 minutes before we use it. Okay, we wanna give that flour a little bit of time to hydrate. And please note, when you pull that out of the fridge in like five or 10 minutes, it will have thickened up a little bit, which is to be expected and totally fine. And that's it, at this point we are now ready to fry, which means adding our cold chicken to our cold batter, where we will make sure it's fully coated before it goes into the oil. And by the way, for filming purposes, I'm just gonna to toss three in here and then head to the fryer. All right, when you do this, you can just do one at a time as they're going in the oil. And I would have done that. I just wasn't able to get a good shot of both the bowl and the fryer. But nevertheless, once we have those dipped and coated and we let some of the excess drip off into the bowl, we will carefully place those in the 375 degree oil where we will fry those for about three to four minutes. And yes, because our batter is so thin, those little drips that are falling in the fryer as we do this are gonna produce a whole bunch of frying flakes on the surface, but that is no big deal. And as this fries, those are gonna to stick together and we can actually remove them with our strainer. Oh, and one other thing worth noting here, as any fry cook can tell you, when you deep fry something in brand new oil, like I'm doing here, the first batch or two are always gonna come out very light. So even though this first batch looks a little bit light as I pull it out, it really was beautifully cooked. 
And as you're about to hear, perfectly crispy. Oh yeah, fork don't lie. But anyway, appearances aside, the coating seemed perfect, but I decided to bite in to make sure. And that, my friends, when you consider taste and texture, was just a phenomenal fried chicken finger. And you can see that coating is like impossibly thin, yet still somehow maintains a beautiful crispiness. And by using that slightly sweeter, fruitier cider instead of beer, I think we really do get something that's more flavorful. Oh, and upon further review, with the new oil, I didn't want to overcook these to get a deeper golden brown. But after tasting, they were still very moist and juicy. So I probably could have fried another half minute, which I'll do in the next batch. And of course, we don't want to eat these plain, which is why I whipped up a little bit of my hot and sweet mustard dipping sauce, which I will include in the written recipe. But it's really nothing more than some Dijon, rice vinegar, and hot sauce. And as far as things to stick in dips go, it does not get any better than a crispy fried chicken finger. So I really did thoroughly enjoy this test batch and then headed back to the fryer to make some more. Oh, by the way, on these, let me show you one trick I learned from my Japanese fried chicken friends. One thing you might want to try is that about halfway through the cooking time, let's go ahead and pull these up out of the oil and just let them cool down in the air for about 20 to 30 seconds or so and then put them back in to continue the frying. And apparently that's supposed to make your coating even crispier. And yes, if you're doing a lot of these, you can just cook these all like 75% of the way and then let them cool completely and keep them in the fridge and then just crisp them up in the hot oil for a few minutes when you're ready to serve. And besides that little trick, I did let this batch fry about 30 seconds more, which as you can see did result in these being a little more golden brown. But that's also because we already fried a batch. And then just because these are called chicken fingers does not mean we can't go with a fine dining presentation, as I'm attempting to do here by placing these over an arugula, apple, and celery salad that I dress with a simple apple cider vinaigrette. And then instead of serving this with a dip, which is never going to get you a Michelin star. We'll go ahead and spoon the dip over and also call it a sauce for what I think is a much nicer, or as we say in the business, higher end presentation. And obviously use whatever kind of dipping sauce you want, except ranch if you're going higher end. But that tangy, spicy, sweet goodness of this mustard dip really did pair perfectly. And the combination of those hot, crispy chicken fingers with that cold, crunchy salad really was an amazing pairing. Speaking of which, the combination of that sweet, juicy crunch of an apple and that bitter, juicy crunch of the celery really does help punch up all the other flavors. So not only was this some of the best chicken fingers I've had in recent memory, it was one of the best salads I've had in a long time. Which reminds me, nothing makes vegetables and salads more kid-friendly than topping it with crispy fried chicken fingers, which also makes it very adult-friendly as well. But no matter what you serve it on or with, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy.